like this as well. That is to say, three parts. Now, this is for your notes what we call the tripartite, three part, the tripartite view of the soul. Socrates is going to argue there's two of you. <clears throat> there's a physical, but there's also this thing called your soul, which is something metaphysical. But about that soul, he's going to say there's three parts. Now, this will become highly influential in the 20th century with our study of Sigmund Freud and the idea of the psyche, so pay close attention. Socrates says, first of all, at the top, referencing the leaders who have wisdom, there is reason. Okay? The second group, similar to the soldiers, there is emotions. Okay? The third part of the soul, as referenced by our third class of the workers, there is desire. Okay? Now the word picture that Plato loves to use, and he uses it in a couple of different dialogues, is, uh, dialogues, is the idea of a chariot where you have the driver of the chariot and then you have two horses out in front. The only way that that chariot goes forward is for the driver to be able to control both of the ponies. If one of the ponies wants to go to the right and the other pony wants to go to the left, that driver's got some serious problems, agreed? That is to say, for Socrates, the just individual is the individual who lets reason govern the other two of the parts of the soul, if you will. Reason is the driver, emotions and desires, the ponies. It's not to say that emotions and desires are wrong, it's that they must be controlled by reason. The just individual is that individual then who allows for reason to control his emotions, her emotions, his desires, her desires. Think about the myth of Maverick. And all of a sudden, this starts to make sense. The money falls on the floor. Your desire is to say, finders, keepers, listers, sweepers. Yes, my money. Your emotions tell you, uh, okay, so here's the thing, dude, you could get caught, you could get caught, you could get caught. Fear, right? Worry, 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 fear, right? Like, what if I pick it up and I put it in my pocket and then the owner of Maverick comes walking in and they got me on video? Probably not working at Maverick anymore, but then all of a sudden I may have problems at other jobs as well. I, ah, emotions. And then you got raisin, which asks some really simple questions about the money on the floor. What if it's Monopoly money? I mean, think about it. What if it's Monopoly money? So it's $5,000 of Monopoly money. Dude, unless you're some kind of serious Monopoly player, you know, who needs some extra money stashed somewhere next time you play Monopoly, you're probably going to go, oh, matey, you're like, you're like strange or something. I don't know why you're carrying around $1,000 bills of Monopoly money, but you dropped your money on the floor. Really, what's the difference? Because the money I was describing that's legitimate currency, legitimate, is just ink on paper. I mean, really, how is it any different from Monopoly money? I mean, you're familiar with the stories, for example, at the end of the Civil War, right? When they would put whole amounts of money inside of a wheelbarrow just so they could get a loaf of bread. In other words, that money doesn't mean anything until it has value. Well, who decides value? Money that's Monopoly money versus money that's legal tender. Who gets to decide? Well, it's relative to the, you know, obviously to the society at large. To that degree, you could use your reason and point out simply, you know, it's just paper with ink on it. I mean, if you think about it, it's not like you're going to eat it. You can't eat it to sustain yourself. You've got to use it to buy something of value. Does that make sense? To that degree, it ain't nothing but paper with some ink on it. Right? Of course, there's also this question. Do you really, reason, see, back to reason. Do you really, by the way, this is not the actual Socratic answer to the myth of Maverick, but it at least gets us trending in that direction. Do you really want to live in a culture where when things drop on the floor, people pick them up for themselves? Do you really want to live in that culture? Because if you really live in that culture, extrapolate out. When something bad happens and you pick up the phone and dial 911, the person on the other end of the line says, sucks to be you, and hangs up. Right? You want to live in that culture. Do you want to live in a culture where you go in with head trauma and the person who's working uh, you know, in head trauma uh, never actually studied in med school but cheated her way all the way through med school? Do you really want that person operating on your mom and her brain? See, it's funny to me the students that go, oh, no, but those are the same students 
who when they have the opportunity to take the grade illegally, they'll do it, pick up the money off the floor. Of course, if you ask them, do you really want to live in a world where everybody that has expertise, can we just qualify that as all the people in this triangle? The people who have expertise, they only got that expertise because they cheated their way to that position. Do you really want to live in that world? Well, there goes all our medical practice practitioners. They're gone, right? Because they cheated their way to get to their med degrees. Do you really want to live in that world? And see, so, and immediately you go, dude, I can't live. No, nobody wants to live in that world. That is right. See how that works? In other words, in a moment, we've already given you a pretty decent answer to the myth of Maverick. Do you really want to live in a world where when stuff falls to the floor, somebody picks it up and calls it their own? Right? So that means the next time you're at the Blairs or whatever and you're leaving, you drop some money on the ground, the person behind you goes, sweet, I got money. No, because the next time, right, when you're the ones finding the money, it may occur to you, wow, they may need that money just the way you do. Ta-da. So we've already got an answer to this question of what is the just or the ideal individual. That is to say, a person who allows for her or his reason to control emotions and desire. It's not that you don't want the money. Your instincts are to say yes. But reason is able to control the ponies. It's a nice word picture, right? To control the ponies. It's at this point that we're now at the end of Republic Four, And Socrates is done, you know? He kind of goes, okay, 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 so that's my answer. I'm done with it. And um, Glaucon says, wait. Now we're to Republic Five. Glaucon says, wait. You said something earlier I gotta ask you about. Can I ask you about it? Socrates so like, yeah, yeah, sure. There. Now, looking at this from a larger perspective, we realize Plato wrote this dialogue, and he makes up obviously a dialogue that leads an intelligent reader to ask similar kinds of questions. In other words, this notion of why I don't pick up the money and I give it back every time has been answered by the end of Republic IV, but not completely. Don't worry, we're going to get there. We're going to take a little pause. And that's Republic V, so write that in your notes. We're going to take a little pause. And we're going to have Socrates entertain three questions. Okay? This is what we call the three waves of Republic. The questions come in order of three waves. Three radical ideas. That's how I'd write it down. Three radical ideas. Plato is an iconoclast, as we have talked about many times in 303, a person who challenges ideas. And now he's going to address three of them. The reason he's going to address three of them has to do with his notion of creating the ideal state. What I just said is hypercritical because Book 5 of Republic has been misinterpreted for a really long time, and here's why. Readers have forgotten Plato is not arguing, let's build an ideal state. In fact, he will, give, he will go so far as to say, you can't have an ideal state until you have individuals who are just. However, he has said in his ideal state three radical things. Let's list them in order. The first tidal wave, if you can think about it that way. In other words, it's going to destroy a lot of things. The first tidal wave. The first radical tidal wave is women are equal with men and therefore can be leaders. That's what Socrates said. One of the reasons Socrates said that is, check this out, he said this thing called your soul, there's no such thing as a female soul or a male soul. Every male, every female has the capacity of reason, emotion, and desires. Saying, Socrates is the first person in the West to suggest that women can be educated like men, and therefore their education can produce that right there, a just soul. If that's true, then that means that women can rule just like men, and therefore should be given all the same opportunities. Radical idea. Number two. This is the most controversial part of Plato's Republic. It has to do with the ideal state and the notion of family. If you're going to have a group of people that are completely united, Socrates says the entire state has to be like one happy family, where everybody is in the same family. This is what we call the dissolution of the, of the nuclear family. The idea that he postulates is a eugenics idea, where you work to bring together your potential leaders 
with other potential leaders to produce offspring that will then also be potentially leaders. Your soldiers with other soldiers to produce possibly. It's the same thing that we do when we're, of course, trying to raise ponies, right? If you want an outstanding pony, you put two outstanding ponies together to produce the outstanding pony. The same Socrates argues in an ideal state would function in terms of the same eugenics project. Now, of course, this is a radical idea tried in the 20th century tragically by a number of cultures, namely the United States. If you don't know about that project, go and do a little bit of research. Your government thought this was a pretty good idea for a while. And of course, it's a kind of horrific idea. But one of the interesting side products of this view, and again, Socrates is arguing that if you want to do this ideal state gig, then that's a way to get there. But one of the interesting questions is when you look at the people who are the leaders, when you look at the people who run the society, ask a simple question. If they're married, who are they married to? And where they meet the people they were married to? Oh, well, that's interesting, because most of them end up going to the same kind of universities. Hmm. Where they met their significant other. Among a pool of like-minded individuals in terms of ability. Then when they have children, what is it that they want to do? Get them the best education they can. Why are you sitting in an honors class? Well, so I can get college credit and I can mm -mm, keep thinking. Well, because I'll have more opportunity if I go to college. Keep thinking. So that I can do things other people can't do. That is right. In other words, this kind of thing gets played out. Notice whether it's random or intentional. The eugenics project is obviously intentional. It's a disturbing concept, but I think it's one worthy of at least playing around with in the abstract. And that's exactly what Socrates is doing, playing around with the abstract. Third wave. Then we'll be finished for this hour. Third wave. The third wave is the real question of how do you create an ideal state? And Socrates answers, the only way you can create an ideal state is for your leaders to be philosopher kings. Write that term down. That's normally how it's translated. Philosopher kings. Leading, obviously, God kind of go, whoa, 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 what did you just call me? A philosopher king. What is that? And Socrates says, you know, you know, philosopher kings, they're the guys that, uh, you know, that, that have uh, an appreciation of the forms, you know, at the end of book five. You know, they know the forms, that's what they do, they know the forms. And God goes, whoa, 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 what are you talking about the forms, what is that about? And this will, of course, now open up Republic 6-7, where Plato is actually headed, ultimately, to Republic 7, book 7, where... Plato is going to give you the real answer to the myth of Maverick. Why would you give the money back every time, and why would you like it? See, check this out. You might give the money back, but still your reason might be like, i got to give it back, because I need to. But your emotions might say, man, I would really, and your desires go, shh, I could really use that money. How would you give it back and be happy about it? That is an intriguing question. Again, some of you look skeptically at being like, yeah, they ain't no way. There's a reason why. This text has been around as long as it's been around. Let's come back and let's wrestle with it. Not that you've got to agree with everything. Obviously, you're going to throw out the notion of eugenics, right? But it does make sense to at least know the ideas before you get ready to get rid of them, right? Thanks, guys.